Welcome to the Total Connector Show. My name is Kevin Devani. My very special guest is Corey Clipson of Bitcoin. Corey, how are you doing? Thanks so much for your time and coming on my show for the first time. Yeah, Kevin, thanks for having me on. Really uh, excited to to tell the story and get to know you a little better. Yeah, I've been so I've been following you and your project. Um, the reason I love your project and, and uh, I listened to some of your interviews. Which one, last one, was it with Peter McCormack? Or was Steve, uh, we haven't done I, Peter's yet. Uh, we've got Stefan Lavera coming up, but the most recent ones have been um, Echo Chamber, Citizen Bitcoin, exactly. Eric Savick's show, Protocol Podcast, a few others. Yeah, I, I've, I've been listening to so many podcasts, I'm getting confused, like who's, who's with whom. So, um, Corey, so the... Um, why don't you tell me first a little bit about your background? Uh, what I also find interesting on your Twitter handle, it says uh, you're this you're a student of Talib. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Just also, you know, briefly your path to Bitcoin, your you know the vision you had, or or you know your comprehension of Bitcoin, how you how you got into Bitcoin. Thank you. Sure, sure. Uh, well, we've got this thing called the internet now, which is awesome, which means you can be a student of someone without actually having to attend their class. And technically, they don't even need to teach a class, although uh, Mr. Nicholas Tello does have a couple of MOOCs out there that he's taught in the past, um, but all one way. He doesn't do a lot of uh, back and forth discussion. Anyway, um, so yeah, I, I guess uh, I, I first discovered him in, uh, in a New Yorker article by Malcolm Gladwell in 2002 and ran out to pick up uh, the tipping point. Everything that he said and as he was described was just like uh, right in line with how I was thinking about things at the time. And uh, he's just been like a really good guiding uh, thinker for me uh, over the past 17 years. And, you know, I've, I've used sort of barbell strategies and trying to pick up free call options and all of these sort of tenets of Talebian philosophy and, and strategy, uh, in multiple moves of my career of, uh, different startups I've been involved in and certainly thinking about, uh, you know, how to apply things like decentralization and, uh, anti-fragility and, and free call options and things like that. Just kind of like protect your downside and structure things so that you have unbounded upside. That's kind of everything boils down to try to make your life and business look like a call option function. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's Taleb to me. He's, it, it, in some ways, it's almost just seeing everything like a trader. Got um, it. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And how'd you get into Bitcoin? I mean, what was the first, first encounter experience? Yeah, sure. So, um, so I've been in tech for a long time. Um, started my career at Microsoft and most recently a large company was Google. And then I've been working with like Silicon Valley startups for the last seven years, angel investing and advising, sometimes operating when I see a good opportunity. And um, so I was at a tech conference, January 29th of 2014. And uh, someone had a uh, you know, blockchain wallet and was trying to get people to sign up for blockchain wallets and giving them $50 of Bitcoin in a blockchain wallet. And uh, so I, I did, I got it. And uh, I proceeded to not read the white paper, not go down the rabbit hole and lose the private key. Uh, so that was my first exposure to Bitcoin. And uh, we'll get into it a little bit, but a lot of this product and, and the company is to try to go and save you know, 2014 Corey. <laughs> make him not do the dumb thing of ignoring Bitcoin. Um, and then, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, it's just really the noise uh, that, that Bitcoin and, and, you know, crypto broadly was creating in, um, in tech circles in the run up in early 2017 that got my attention. And, um, you know, thankfully, some, some people here in Los Angeles pointed me and said, you got to start with Bitcoin first. Uh, so I read Digital Gold and started, you know, kind of digging in and found some Trace Mayer podcasts and kind of whatever else was out there. Um, but very much came at it with a tech lens. I thought this was a technology. I thought that you could go and like create, you know, what I would now call a friction token, you know, for pretty much any sort of marketplace platform business, because that was always my specialty is, is marketplace platforms in, in tech. And um, so I very much had kind of the wrong mental model for it, which you know, let's call it the Stanford mental model, <laughs> um, you know, and then it took me, I guess that was like, you know, summer of 17. It took me until about probably March, April of 18 to sort of flip that and really realize that this is probably 85 or 90% money and, you know, a little bit of tech, important technology that enables that money supporting it. But you really have to view this whole thing as, as a new money. 
Um, and yeah, so then I, I basically have just been working full time on Bitcoin, you know, since then. Uh, spent all of fall of 2018 and winter of 18, 19, just kind of like learning and accumulating and, and networking as much as possible with, you know, discovering who the, the true Bitcoin thought leaders were and kind of getting rid of noise and not paying attention to trading and price moves as much and really just understanding it as deeply as I could and trying to figure out how to actually work in the space. Uh, it's something that obviously, you know, thousands of people at this point have struggled with. You fall in love with Bitcoin and you want to, work on it all day and make money doing it. And that's been my path since, uh, you know, September 1 of 2018 is when I decided I wanted to work in Bitcoin and I figured I'd have to start my own thing uh, or join somebody and, um, and just trying to figure out what that was. Wow. Uh, so, uh, so it seems like, uh, you know, because I'm, the, the reason I'm really fascinated by the, by the story is how, how people get into Bitcoin and then understanding the essence of what is Bitcoin, you know, the scarcity aspect, you know, the like, you know, monetary properties, because we, ne we never learned that. So I want to know, I wanted to know, you know, did you get like, like instantaneously or, or did it take you like after a while and, uh, you know, went into the rabbit hole and then you, you suddenly understood, wow, that's like absolute scarcity. I mean, if I had understood that from the be very beginning, what scarcity is, I would have taken it, you know, uh, probably different paths from, from, from beginning. Um, this yeah, is yeah. Me. Yeah, I mean, if, if there was only Bitcoin there, that would have been very easy. Uh, mm -hmm. Or if I had, had somebody to sit me down, you know, for two weeks straight and just like bludgeon me with the logic from first principles uh, about what's clearly understood only by people who study Bitcoin a lot, that yes, there's, there's true scarcity with Bitcoin. And even if there's some other coins that only have 10 million coins or only a billion coins or whatever, like, their, sc their scarcity doesn't actually matter because they don't have the, the social layer and the shelling point around Bitcoin. So, you know, I didn't understand what a shelling point was, you know, intrinsically at the very beginning. It wasn't something I'd been exposed to. I wasn't a gold bug. Um, you know, I grew, up in a, I grew up in the matrix, like most of us. You know, I grew up in this fiat matrix <laughs> that, uh, that's hard to break out of and it's hard to see it differently. Um, you know, I did have the advantage of having been exposed to a lot of econ in the background. Um, I had done a decent bit in undergrad and then I went to University of Chicago for my MBA and took a lot of econ there and also did just kind of like a lot of reading. Um, the closest I got, I did do a tiny bit of Hayek, but it, it didn't take, like I didn't, it wasn't gospel at the time, the way it is kind of for me now. Um, but at least one of my, um, you know, Chicago trader friends, not from business school, um, introduced me to Milton Friedman and read free to choose and started to think about, you know, you know, Hey, the silver rule is actually kind of more dope than the golden rule, which is, you know, do not do unto others as you would not have them do unto you, which is, I think a lot more powerful than the golden rule, um, as a guiding principle for how to live life and how to structure society and things like that. Um, so yeah. So then when, when I started to understand that, you know, Bitcoin might be a little bit more about, you know, economics and politics and money, and, and scarcity than just tech, then some of the underpinnings from a decade previous started to help with my understanding and accelerate it maybe a little bit faster than it otherwise would. Yeah, you just mentioned Hayek. So uh, um, you, you probably seen this also in uh, the Bitcoin standard, this quote from Hayek or also this short interview on YouTube where he talks about the sly roundabout because um, we cannot you know, stop the government or somehow, you know, but there's only, I don't know, paraphrasing it, like a sly roundabout way to, to circumvent this, you know, and here mm -hmm. we go, you know, so, uh, uh, he, so this is, this could be actually, he could have foreseen Bitcoin then, uh, <laughs> if, yeah. um, with his words, it's, it's really fascinating. Um, uh, cause the, if, to him, it seemed to him like the, uh, his, 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 in, uh, like his, his comprehension was that there is no other way than to create, uh, a new structure, uh, you know, a new money that is, that is, you know, that has all the properties which Bitcoin has, unconfiscatable, yeah. unstoppable, unseizable, and what have you, right? Yeah, Until absolutely. Decentralized. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, he foresaw it, obviously the, the, the giants upon whose shoulders we stand, like Wei Dai and Nick Zabo, like they foresaw it and we're, and Adam back, like, and they, they wanted it to exist and we're just trying and trying and trying and, you know, in many ways, it was just it was just the last ten percent 
Uh, but it was also the zero to one moment, as Peter Thiel would say, of right. Satoshi actually cracking the thing, right? Like yeah. we went from nothing to something, but we also went from like 95% of the way there to actually getting there. You know, I think um, it's interesting. I'm finally, it's taken like 18 months, but I'm in the final stretches of uh, Neil Stevenson's Cryptonomicon. Mm -hmm. which I think came out in 2000 or 2001. And it's the story of the creation of a digital currency with unforgeable, you know, you can't duplicate it. You can't counterfeit it. Oh, I got to read that like, one. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it, the guy's a visionary. Um, and he's from Seattle. So I hope he's also a Seahawks fan, although I haven't confirmed that one. <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's just interesting how often this has come up that we would love. I mean, we, we hear the stories of others. There's a, 402 error in internet protocol which is just like you know it, it's sitting there waiting for digital cash to be invented even as early as as the creation of ip and we just hadn't cracked it until 2008 2009 mm -hmm. exactly um so what i love about you know your project and after listening to it, it's it's like the simplicity of it it's the simplicity first of all and uh uh embedded within the ethos uh, you know, of, 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 of your approach, of your strategy, like, like, like get the people have, have them a skin in the game before, you know, trying, you know, really in a complicated way, trying to educate them. And it's a lot of knowledge, a lot of facets, a lot of aspects you have to, they really need to, you know, people need to go into the rabbit hole by themselves. So, what is it? How, how do you how do you approach how do you approach people? Like, what, what's the uh, what? I, what also I'm interested in demographically? What kind of people? Um, is there is there like is it totally multifaceted the demographically? Well, well, let's let's go thirty thousand foot view just because some of your listeners may not know exactly what the product does. Um, so givebitcoin.io. Uh, what we like to say is give plus time lock plus educate equals Bitcoiner. And essentially, uh, so Kayvon may have, you know, cousin Jenny uh, thinks cousin Jenny has all the, all the right ingredients to become a Bitcoiner because she's a human and we'll all be Bitcoiners one day. Um, and then, oh, good. Cool. There you go. So, yeah, so you would just go and you would give up there at the top and say, I'm going to give to uh, cousin Jenny. And, um, then you're going to select uh, an amount to give to cousin Jenny after entering, entering her email address. This is kind of like give by email. We're going to add phone numbers soon. Use the give flow instead of the request flow. Request, you have to actually sign up for an account. You can actually give without signing up for an account. Um, do you want to go, come on? Yeah. Uh, do you want to go to the give flow? Uh, which one is it? Oh, I think you're screen sharing right now. Yeah, 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 so, sure. yeah, yeah. So if you hit, oh, give, give. oh, there like you go. Sorry, there yeah. you go. So yeah, mm -hmm. so you give Bitcoin, and then click that, and then we'll see. So basically, uh, and I'll just describe it from here. But you can just mm -hmm. uh, enter their email address. You can include a note, and you hit next. And basically, if you've already entered your payment details, which is just ACH right now, so it's bank account and um, and routing number, uh, mm -hmm. and we're integrating Clad, that should be up by the end of the month or or, or in early December. So you can actually just log into your own bank account, which is an awesome UX improvement. Um, so then you decide how much you want to give. Uh, right now it's between $10 and $5,000 and you can give one time or recurring. And then uh, Jenny gets an email and says that, you know, you've, you've given her some Bitcoin and uh, she signs up for an account so that there's somewhere to actually hold her Bitcoin. And uh, that's, that's with the custodian prime trust. We can talk about that more in a, in a minute because that's going to be very important to Bitcoiners uh, as it is to us, like why we've actually made that, that choice trade-off. Uh, and, and then only after Jenny or whoever has actually signed up for an account and uh, clicks accept does the transaction go through. So you don't spend any money if you go and you know, give out 100 gifts at CES at a conference of 10 bucks each. Only the 20 people that really go through the flow and are, are, are signing up for the 12 months of the guide to Bitcoin coming to their email and have like a decent chance of getting red pills and becoming a Bitcoiner. Those are the only ones for whom you're, you're actually being charged. Right, right. Uh, so who are, um, who are the people in, on average that do give or do requests? I mean, that would be, would be interest to me. Like, what, what, is there like an age range or, uh, you know, demographically, where do they come from? 
you know, so we're, what's the we're, re we're recording right now on the on the 25th of November, uh, and mm -hmm. it's a it's a Monday, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And we went live on Wednesday afternoon. So it's new. Um, God, that said, God. we had we had two weeks of uh, alpha launch with about 60 people. And then we had uh, two weeks of beta with uh, about 1000 people, 1500, I think, um, clicking around. So we have seen some things. Um, I would say the uh, the number of like 250 and 500 dollar gifts has surprised us. Uh, we weren't expecting people to do that many uh, larger amounts that fast. Uh, and we actually have had some outliers as well. So there was a call that gave uh, $4,500 to each of his niece and his nephew. Uh, and it wasn't somebody we knew, it was somebody totally random who found it. So that was pretty cool to see that. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I can tell you like I, when I try to introduce people to the platform, the number that I keep on choosing is 21 bucks, just cause I like the association of 21 million. And, you know, my email address is 21 million at givebitcoin.io. I do look at those, at least for now, while we're small, uh, every single one of them. So feel free to email me on anything. Um, so I like that. You know, I think the break point's probably right, like probably around 100 bucks, where I think we'll see like a, a huge number of gifts, you know, 100 and less and like quite a few over. And maybe that'll be like 50 50 in transaction volume. Right. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, there's uh, the concept of the time lock. So can you elaborate a little bit? Like, uh, are there different time locks or um, can they? Yeah, so this this is interesting. So uh, I think what we're going to, so right now, basically, it's just uh, minimum one year, maximum five years, and you can choose any date in between. So that's, that's just how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a contractual time lock. It's not a smart contract. It's not on chain. It's uh, It's basically just being held for you in a user segregated account at Prime Trust, which is the same, you know, trust company that is used by uh, Binance, Huobi, OKX, Bittrex, and a bunch of OTC desks and funds and companies uh, for their US customers. Um, so very comfortable with them. They use Fireblocks on the back end um, for their, their storage. Uh, and our Bitcoin is never lent out. It's never rehypothecated. It's never, you know, given over to shorts. Uh, we don't make any money from the holding of your Bitcoin. In fact, give Bitcoin and never, never does touch your dollars or your Bitcoin and can never access either. Uh, that's something else that's really important to know about give Bitcoin. If you don't have your money, never touch it. Oh, and also just, uh, I sometimes forget to mention this. You cannot give away your own Bitcoin. You can only purchase. We're a one-way on-ramp. Okay. Um, so people ask about that sometimes. Um, we, we want you to hold all your Bitcoin. Uh, we think that we should be uh, having you liquidate dirty fiat for beautiful orange coin. <laughs> let's, make, let's make the flippening happen. And the flippening is uh, to Bitcoin. Right, right. Um, so what, does, do you guys have, or do you and um, you're the founder, I mean, uh, what was the vision from the very beginning? Did you, like, did you have like a roadmap? um uh for yourself like how how you want to proceed with that is that is that is that the concept you're going to stick to that concept or or can you talk about yeah. it and, and yeah yeah we can talk we freely talk about it constantly <laughs> exactly what we're doing we're very very open and, and share exactly what our plans are and i think that's one of the reasons that you know we get a lot of uh people involved because the people that like what we're doing are the ones who come and want to help and so we go to a conference and we have you know 12 unpaid volunteers wearing give Bitcoin shirts and wearing blue Santa hats. And all they have to do is talk about Bitcoin. Like we could leverage anyone who wants to talk about Bitcoin can pitch our company. Like it's super easy. Um, so that's actually kind of where we're headed. I'll, I'll get to that. So had the idea on April 10th, uh, quickly recruited kind of a co-founding team, uh, designed the product in May and June, um, started building the product with actually with a dev shop that I'm a partner in called Purpose Lab. Um, which has uh, a huge number of overseas devs and a really good sort of management team in Los Angeles. Um, so we did first line of code July 1st, had the site live by mid-October in, uh, in the alpha and launched to everybody last week. Um, so our pace of development is obviously like quite fast and we, we do know what we're doing and I definitely benefit from having been an investor and advisor in over 40 startups over the past seven years. Um, seen a lot of interesting things and have some have some lumps and have some successes and some exits and things like that. Um, we believe that this simple utility of being able to give Bitcoin to people and having that have a much 
higher chance of them becoming a Bitcoiner versus anything else that you might try. Certainly, uh, best chance for success given the amount of effort because you're essentially outsourcing your evangelism to us. Uh, and then also having the, the flip side of that, having uh, the ability to request Bitcoin, to put Bitcoin on your wish list. Uh, so if you're, you know, if you'd rather have Bitcoin as a present for Christmas, bar mitzvah, graduation, wedding, whatever, uh, we're a super easy way to do that and hang up a shingle and let your friends and family and colleagues and classmates or whatever know that you want Bitcoin instead of a sweater. Um, and so we think that will spread very quickly uh, across, you know, Gen Z and, and younger uh, who want to accumulate Bitcoin. They can actually pull a bunch of Gen X and Boomer relatives into Bitcoin by forcing them to, you know, acknowledge that someone they love wants Bitcoin more than anything else in the world. I think that'll be really powerful. Right. So how do you how do you um, how do you know how do you know that people understand the, you know the the real potential of bitcoin i mean you know when people are, are they're gifted bitcoin uh, do they really understand the the true potential of what is you know like the, i always i don't i'm trying to avoid the, the word mass adoption but when it comes to the critical adoption rate you know would it be the number uh, or the speed do do you i mean is that your experience is that your so we will so okay so the education. So let's talk about that. So uh, all of it, as we complete the chapters, and we're we're about done with with chapter one, and and going to post that, and we're sort of in final final draft stages and comments for chapter two. We're putting out twelve chapters in the guide to Bitcoin, and you know it's kind of laid out. It, I mean, our the people who partially own the company are some of the top authors and podcasters. So it's, you know, Safety and Moose and Jan Pritzker and the Bitcoin Rabbi and Stefan Levera and Jan, you know, like all these people that have written the books and are doing podcasts, Matt O'Dell from Tales from the Crypt, that we're interviewing all of our advisors and other people about how they would talk about certain topics for a new coiner. And then the chapters are structured essentially as a Q&A. So it's the questions of a new coiner and the answers of the Bitcoin expert. Essentially, that's kind of like the amalgamated voice of reason from people who really understand Bitcoin and have done a lot of educating. So that's how it's structured and that's how we're putting it together. Uh, our author and editor is a gentleman named Matt Ruby, who's been one of the top tech educators for the last you know, 18 years or so. He wrote the Signal versus Noise blog for the first eight years that that existed. That's 37 Signals. It's the guys who wrote Rework and Remote and the Palm Company and and you know they, the the creators of Basecamp for project management software, which probably many of your listeners use or have used. Um, and invented Ruby on Rails, which uh, a lot of our Bitcoin dev friends, I'm sure, have used on on different projects over their careers. Um, so it's a it's a good. He's the right guy to take something complex and make it simple enough to understand. Um, and you know, there have already been incredible efforts made by by others in that. But this is like specifically for this use case of somebody who cares enough about you to want to try to red pill you. You know, this is your unique circumstance. You've been given some Bitcoin. What does that mean? Why have we, you know, as we say, uh, skipped you forward to? Uh, be a stage four Bitcoiner, you're a forced hodler. Now we're gonna go and backfill you and try to get you interested, try to get you learning, try to get you buying. You're already a hodler. And then we wanna educate you and, and prepare you for full Bitcoin citizenship if that's the route that you wanna go. So, you know, basically like we talk about stage five is like, uh, you know, private keys and stage six is like cold storage and stage seven is like, no, you know, running a full node and, and doing private transactions. Um, so we're trying to, skip people all the way forward to a stage four hodler and prepare them to take those steps for five, six, and seven and introduce them to, to you know, how you become a, a Yeah, hodler. that's a fantastic Basically. strategy. I mean, I love that strategy. It's just, you know, you, 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 people are gifted Bitcoin, you time lock them. So, you know, they you can just, you know, rest assured, just, just, you know, have a good sleep over it. And, and in the meantime, they'll, they're educated. They can inform themselves. And from every, like all these people you mentioned, like whatever, Safina and the Moose, Economical, Austrian Economics, Monetary Properties, uh, you know, the bigger picture, what is possible. Um, uh, so that's that's uh, a really awesome strategy. And it's simple. Um, what, what is yeah, So when people talk about like, what's our expansion strategy? Like, what else are you going to do? It's like, well, we're in the US and we're tiny and we can't, like people can't give to people in the U.S. and we can't have people giving outside the U.S. 
So we first want to, you know, go global. Uh, the back end already supports 140 countries and all of their currencies. So like that's just got to turn it on basically country by country as we do the legal review. There's nothing technically blocking us from doing that. Um, and then there are other things that we can do uh, specifically with the product that we think will make it much more attractive. So the first thing that we're in, in development on right now, um, and we should have an announcement out here actually this week because we actually have a way to kickstart it. Uh, we're going to roll out basically the best way so far uh, to stack sats for most Bitcoiners, which is telling people about Bitcoin and just referring to this platform. And we're going to share 50% uh, of our transaction fees in perpetuity with referrers. Uh, and we think that's yeah. going to let, you know, millions of people who want to stack sats, as we've seen with great products like Lolly, we love and fold app and some of these other awesome, you know, stack work. Uh, shit, you even got a uh, Bitcoin blast with like 500,000 downloads now. So we're like playing like a balloon blast kind of game and they're earning some sats between levels for watching a video ad or something like, <laughs> you know, you've got video games integrating, you know, sats earnings, things like that. We're going to, we're going to be like a, for those people that want to talk about Bitcoin, so this is, you know, all of the Bitcoin meetups, this is all the college Bitcoin clubs, blockchain education network, whatever, you know, anyone that wants to go to a conference and evangelize for this, you'll have a code, you'll have a QR code, you'll have, you know, a way to, to evangelize for Bitcoin and a way for somebody to get involved by giving and requesting, requesting Bitcoin. So you could just tell a 16 year old that Bitcoin's awesome tell them about the site and they can go ask their relatives for Bitcoin and you as the one who referred that 16 year old to Bitcoin, you're going to stack stats on that. <laughs> Great. Um, so I think that's going to be uh, pretty, you know, the, that's potentially pretty game changing because it's something I am going to do like crazy. Like I'm going to have a ref code. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, we're, we're building this utility, but I get to participate and I'm going to be there trying to, you know, get everyone into my first level referral network before you do. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, you're I the founder. Stack stats forever. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And you know, I mean, you have also the highest motivation and, and inspirational power. Um, what do you think are the countries are gonna be, is there like sort of a, a vision for, for the, you know. The rollout? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's like a lot of companies, it's just easier to start with like English and with people with kind of the same mm -hmm. uh, legal codes and where you know there's a lot of cross pollination. So I think we'll go, you know, Canada first and then the rest of the Commonwealth countries and then into Europe and, and you know, eventually get to uh, LADAM Asia, et cetera. Like, we'll see. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the plan. Mm -hmm. What about the countries, you know, where people are in need, they feel the pain? such as uh, Venezuela, Argentina, Turkey, Iran, wherever, South America, any other countries that could be, you know, potentially like, you know, uh, more inclined to do that? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, so to, to give or receive, you have to pass an OFAC scan. So some countries, unfortunately, are, are SOL, um, and that, that's awful, but that's just kind of the way it is. I think what we'll probably just do is like, you know, we, we obviously talk to all of the companies and projects that are doing things for those countries and we'll just be supportive. And if, if Give Bitcoin takes off and is profitable or gets a lot of, you know, investment or whatever it is, um, you know, I think we just want to be supportive of awesome, you know, open source projects that are, that are more in, in the realm of the things that we're training people to participate in. So we want to be super supportive of, of BTC pay server and all kinds of things in the lightning world and, and essentially just be doing training exercises in the later modules of the education so that people are learning how to use these things. And, you know, maybe we'll have some kind of exercise with, you know, BTC Venezuela or something where you can send some sats to somebody in Venezuela and maybe give a spark to somebody that that might be important. Um, you know, I, I definitely, uh, you know, we, we definitely plan to translate this into some other languages as well um so it'll you know eventually again provided that we're successful to the degree that we can support this but there also seem to be a lot of volunteers willing to do things like this so we've, we've had an offer to translate into spanish already um both for the curriculum and for the site itself uh, we've had the same offer from uh, a couple of uh, companies and, and individuals in turkey um so that seems like some pretty low-hanging fruit and they have like i think they're like number two per capita in bitcoin purchases um, so it's super popular over there. 
Um, not surprising because it's like Bay and India and a couple other countries, probably uh, Iran, have kind of like a gold culture, and it's, it's easy to see this taking off in places like that. Um, so yeah, I think there are a lot of opportunities for expansion. There's also just you know, so referrals is first, uh, that's underway. Uh, codes is next right after that. So this is just the idea that uh, instead of having to give, you know, with knowing the person's email address or phone number, uh, you could just give them a code and they could go redeem it. Um, so that's pretty powerful and that'll be important for me. You know, we want to definitely have that by, by Bitcoin 2020 and SF and be able to just, you know, kind of hand out codes or have somebody scan a QR code and, and basically go redeem it and just sign up and, you know, and again, it's, it's not like a gift card where the value is actually loaded at the time of the gift. They actually do have to go and sign up and actually accept it before you're billed. Um, so you could basically load up a code with like $1,000 of credit and it could send you know, Peter McCormick or Stefan to a conference and have them give away like 50 gifts of 20 bucks each. And you know, basically the, it would bill against the code until the $1,000 is gone and then it would be off. Got it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um... What are uh, like you are in California? Um, what what I'm interested? What is uh, what's your perception? How 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 are people, um, you know, reacting? Or are there are they more open minded now? You know, in in, in times of you know pending uh, recession or or you know negative interest rate, you know, all these things. I mean, do you have like a is there like a a, a feeling right now that things are mounting up or what do you call it like accumulating in a in a negative way positive well, we, for bitcoin well we i mean we just don't know we don't know if bitcoin is pro cyclical counter cyclical or neither uh i suspect that it's neither i actually think that you know bitcoin's adoption curve totally dominates uh any consideration of like bull market versus bear market um i do know that it's a lot easier to uh get you know, sort of the marginal person to buy a lot of Bitcoin when they're flush. Uh, so I do suspect that Bitcoin is like probably still positively correlated in particular with US equities, um, you know, but, you know, we're seeing that it's taking a long time for a bull market to build and, you know, we've got a little bit of an echo bubble that just kind of like deflated over the last six months and, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. But, you know, I, we've been supposedly heading into a recession in the US uh, you know, ever since 2012, like every, every six months it's supposed to start. Right. And, you know, now people are starting to wonder like, well, with all this money printing, does it have to, or do we just kind of like Japanize the whole thing? And, you know, Tom Lee's talking about S and P 18,000 in 10 years, and that this may actually be the start of a huge bear, a uh, huge bull market in press equities. And, uh, you know, the continuation of trend has been hard to argue with when the money is free. Um, and this is, you know, probably a race to the bottom. As, as we know, the Chinese have printed 30x currency over the last 15 years. So they have 30 trillion instead of 1 trillion of yuan out there. Uh, you've got the ECB, you know, this news out that basically, so LVMH just issued a bunch of debt to scoop up Tiffany's, a U.S. company, and the ECB printed money to loan it to LVMH. So, you know, okay, there's tariff wars with China, but like our friends in Europe, your homeboys are basically financing for free with money printing the acquisition of, you know, iconic American companies. Yeah. And, you know, that's essentially what fueled the Japan M&A boom over the last, you know, in the last few decades was just printing money and using that money to go buy things, which is what China's doing too. So, you know, I, that's just a huge house of cards and there's no safe haven in the fiat world. So, you know, at some point, I think this thing, this Bitcoin thing really does explode. Like, I, I mean, I still, I still have sort of a, you know, 150 to 300 K target personally for planning um, for this next boom cycle, whatever it is, call it by end of 2021 or something like that. Um, but, uh, but we also just don't know. Right. But hey, I mean, uh, the reality has already struck people. I mean, negative, re negative interest rates are already charged on deposit accounts already. I don't know which bank, but in, we're talking about the European Union. So I live in yeah. Austria, so it's already starting and uh, experts are talking about, you know, uh, a heavy crisis coming up in, in, in Germany. Uh, 
you know, banks crashing because they're just overburdened uh, with, with, as you say, you know, just they're, you know, they're insolvent. They're, they're yeah. totally insolvent. Yeah. So yeah. And, you know, the euro is going to be a pretty short experiment when we look back at it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. From a historical perspective. Yeah. Now, the reason I wanted, you know, uh, take your, have your take and your perspective on that, because this is going to be the, the pain points that going to exponentially increase. So uh, because people still don't are too comfortable or too ignorant, I don't know what, 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 how to describe it. You know, we're not talking about, you know, people in Venezuela, Turkey, Iran, where people, uh, you don't have to explain Bitcoin to them. You know, when you have uh, strict capital control, when you have inflation, hype inflation, there is not, you know, much necessity for explanations. So it's self-explanatory. So this is what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, these factors, this <laughs> this could really uh, exponentially, you know, speed up the process of of wanting to, you know, uh, to interact, to use, to hodl Bitcoin. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I mean, I think, you know, somebody's going to do another bail-in at some point, like they're going to have to, or they're just going to print money to the point where there's just like so much unrest because the price of essentials just, you know, basically collapses governments from people protesting, which is, you know, obviously what we're seeing in the, in your heritage land um, right now. Um, and I see things like that happening more and more. Uh, this is unsustainable, the system that we have. I think that's clear. Right. Yeah. What about Lightning Network? Does that would that play a role in in get Bitcoin 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 in the future to come? Or you know, I don't know yet. I, d I think you know right now what we want to do is have people in the later stages of the education uh, experimenting with Lightning, and we're going to have a whole you know whole chapter on layer two networks and how you scale and things like that. Um, and I think maybe we can even have you know some exercises. So one thing about being a giver is you'll have opportunities where we'll cue you and tell you where your recipient, you know, your, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Bitcoiner that you spawned is and like, we'll cue you and say like, Hey, they opened up this email. Maybe they're interested in blank, like feel free to get in touch, but it's always at your option. Uh, you can set it and forget it and never talk to the person again. Cause maybe you just like met them at a conference again. Uh, so you don't have to talk to them, but we'll give you some cues where you can jump in. And so if it's your cousin or your aunt or whatever, we'll, you know, maybe let you both download a, a lightning wallet and send a transaction and play with some tech or something like that. So that's kind of the full vision is to let people actually try these things and, you know, encourage those people that want to pick up a Noddle or a Casa to do so, uh, you know, like let people get a discount on a ledger treasure cold card you know kind of just like put the best the best tech in front of them if they want to do those kinds of things later in their education and the other important thing is we uh we do allow you to stack all along so as soon as you're convinced that you want to own more bitcoin than what you've been given uh you know the three options are give request buy so you can just buy through us all day long one time or recurring so we're also a dca app dollar cost average all right um um did i ask you already like that the 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 transaction fees or the what kind of fees are we talking about like what what's the... yeah so uh transaction fee plus time lock plus custody of one to five years plus the education is all uh two percent with a two dollar minimum so basically two percent for anything above 100 bucks and two bucks if it's less than 100 right okay well i find this project really fantastic um um, what about prop, you know, like advocating or, or educating people? You already mentioned uh, the full node. Um, the, it's it's really a hard process going through this. Like especially uh, now, besides the plug and play, it's um, uh, it's really hard to people are overwhelmed. People are already overwhelmed with a with a with a hardware wallet. From my own experience, mm -hmm. you know, you have to re-explain things over and over again, and it's not easy. It's not user friendly. Uh, people are overwhelmed. They don't have the time, as you know, to educate themselves. Also, but but uh, I think the the expectation I think has has gotten to a degree that um, it, uh, it 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 wasn't like that. I think with other technologies. I mean, do, do you have the impression that we we still have to go a long way till people you know uh, can really use it in a you know intuitive, user friendly way? whatever that is i mean know? everybody's everybody's different right so like when i finally sit down 
uh, this will probably happen over uh, over the Christmas holiday with my brother-in-law, who is both a hardware and a software engineer. Like, he'll probably want to build his own like, you know, Raspberry Pi node, and he'll probably want to use like you know, Justin's, you know, cold card specs and build it from scratch so that, you know, nobody has ever had any opportunity to take his private keys. And that's probably what, where he'll want to receive some Bitcoin. And that's fine because for him, it's like this cool puzzle and it's this new tech. And those are the same kind of people that built the internet, right? Or that started the PC industry. Um, a lot of people aren't like that. You know, I'm giving Bitcoin to my extended family through the platform. And this, you know, this is a bunch of cousins that own restaurants and, Ants that are, you know, lawyers or salespeople or, you know, whatever it is, you know, got a jewel jewelry wholesaler, you know, uncle down in Dallas. Like these people aren't going to understand, you know, public private key cryptography, you know, right away. A couple of them will get interested. I expect a couple of them, especially some of the cousins who are a little bit, you know, younger and tech oriented and grew up with the internet, like they'll probably go whole hog and they'll probably be, you know, self sovereign key holding, you know, Bitcoiners by the end of a year. Um, but a lot of them will probably just want to own some Bitcoin for the price exposure and just for, you know, just as an asset hedge. And, you know, they, they are seeing all the same things from an economic standpoint, a sociopolitical standpoint that we're seeing. And it's a nice hedge um, for them to hold that Bitcoin, uh, regardless of whether they are self custody And we'll obviously be pushing them and trying to get them to take, you know, when they when they're able to hold their bitcoin safely and the risk of them losing it is less than the risk of prime trust in the united states a regulated and highly secure custodian that's good enough for binance like then yes absolutely um otherwise i think it's you know we we talk about sort of i i talk a lot about you know the the, the two ways to defend bitcoin against aggression from a government actor and really the only only government actor that matters is the u.s government because if it's still good in the u.s like it doesn't matter if any it doesn't matter to bitcoin it certainly matters to individual bitcoiners in countries that ban it but it doesn't matter to bitcoin broadly um if other governments come after it but if the u.s had a concerted effort against it what are the bulwarks what are the two ways that you can protect against that the first one is having enough Bitcoiners that are fully self-sovereign, that have their, you know, have their keys protected and have decentralized mining and nodes, nodes in particular, enough to be able to withstand that. And, you know, mesh technologies and ham and all of the things that I like geek out about and listen to all the podcasts. And I started telegram groups to talk about these things with people. And like, I would love to have more to contribute in that. All I can do is contribute like resources and network and hopefully funding in the future and on some of those projects. Uh, the other one brings it back to Taleb. So when people talk about uh, mass adoption, I think what we should be talking about is critical adoption. And critical adoption, uh, it basically directly relates to the, uh, the intolerant minority, which time and time again has been like three to four percent. And so if the only government that actually matters as a threat to Bitcoin in any way, like we know it wouldn't actually kill Bitcoin, it would actually just delay it for like a few decades, maybe a hundred years or something like that, and then Bitcoin would still inevitably rise because it exists. Um, but we could make things very difficult. The US government could make things very difficult for Bitcoin with a concerted effort while it still has its you know, global hegemon status and military and SWIFT and all these different weapons that it could be used. The best way to inoculate against US government action is to reach that level where 4% of US people actually own and care about and understand Bitcoin. And uh, a lot of them will be smattered, you know, throughout the political sphere and the financial sphere and will be Bitcoiners while they are also MDs at Goldman and while they are, you know, representing the 14th district of Ohio or whatever it is, you know, and then even as important, their constituents. So their customers that are clamoring for Bitcoin financial services from, from those banks. And then those voters that will show up at meetings and that will be very active and very vocal on Twitter that make it seem like there's so many more people. So, you know, that number is like 15 to 20 million. So it's not an accident that the stated goal of our, our company, which most people know, is our goal is to create 21 million new coiners. That gets us over the, uh, the critical adoption threshold required to inoculate Bitcoin against adverse actions by the U.S. government. 
That's a really f a phenomenon to me that, I mean, if you look at history, how things have evolved or um, how, as you say, what do you call it, like intolerant minority, mm -hmm. like can push a cause, you know, uh, an ethos, uh, you know, a vision, a principle, uh, whether it be freedom, liberty. Um, so it, it can happen much faster than we, we could expect even. Like what is like three to 4%, it could like yeah, happen. Yeah, it like doesn't, a tipping point. doesn't take long. Yeah, I mean, one, yeah. Of, one of the classic examples and can't remember if Safe already referenced this. It's definitely in in uh, Taleb's writing, uh, but you know, basically the uh, the intolerant minority of halal meat eaters in London have made all all meat basically exactly. at every restaurant is halal. Um, you know, because it's it's good enough for the people that aren't halal, mm -hmm. but it's absolutely required by the people that are. Uh, and then if you actually start looking for like the kosher symbol on products in the U.S., right. like it's insane the number of products. That are kosher because mm -hmm. even coca-cola i heard right isn't that the, the probably example? yeah yeah so like probably that. yeah so like it's just like once you start looking for it it's it's kind of there everywhere because there's like some group of people that are always gonna you know be mad that it's not kosher and mm -hmm. the people that aren't necessarily kosher they don't care they'll eat kosher or not so that intolerant minority you know carries the day so if you have if you have four percent that's just like screaming at you schwab for not moving forward with TD Ameritrade's, you know, already in motion plans to integrate Bitcoin across the board, you know, everybody from Schwab is going to listen to that, you know, mm -hmm. screaming intolerant minority that's going to be super loud and probably going to use all kinds of like organic marketing campaigns <laughs> to try to move people over to Fidelity, right? And so yeah. you're not taken care of maybe three or four percent. But you're going to lose half your customers because that three and four percent is going to be super noisy, and they're going to recruit all their friends over to Fidelity. Crazy. Um, so um, we have a long way to go, but in some ways, like we mm -hmm. also don't have that far to go because the goal is really like fifteen to twenty million. Um, you know, and the in the stat, like we're not we're not close to it yet. So the the stat that I've been uh, repeating, which was passed along to me, is um, one of the one of the top sort of hedge fund slash venture funds in the space that's been in Bitcoin since 2012 um, has, you know, really sophisticated on-chain analysis and really good access to, you know, all sorts of data uh, from across the sphere. And basically about 7 million people globally own $100 or more of Bitcoin. Really? Oh, that's a good city. I didn't know that. Because uh, they, they, the, the global, like the, the total number of, of uh, the estimate for the number, uh, for the total number of hodlers or users of Bitcoin is ranges from, I don't know, some people talk from, you know, 10 million to 30 million, some even talk about 50. So there is, it's really hard to assess yeah. that, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, this one kind of feels right to me. Um, I think you know, a lot of people like I obviously it would be better for our fundraising purposes, you know, finishing out this angel round. It would be better if there were 50 or 60 million Bitcoiners mm -hmm. in some ways. That would be a, a nice thing to promote. But I, I think, you know, the, the truth shall carry the day. And that 7 million number feels a lot closer, um, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of like from who I talk to and actually think about like who might actually own $100 or more of Bitcoin. The fifty million dollar number, or the fifty million number that we've heard a lot, you know, that that includes you know tiny amounts and dust and kind of whatever anyone that's right. ever set up. It might be like a total wallets number, which a lot of people have multiple wallets. Um, obviously, there are some wallets at exchanges that have lots of users, but then you can say like, well, those users are also likely to have you know another wallet, probably a, their only their only balance is not just that one exchange account. Right. Um, so. You know, it, it, it's very possible that something more like, you know, 20 or 30 million people had $100 of Bitcoin in December of 17 or January of 18. That might be possible, but right now it appears that it's probably like 7 million. Yeah. So well, if you go and give somebody $100 or more of Bitcoin from givebitcoin.io, they're immediately in the 99.9th percentile of Bitcoin hodlers. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Top, top tenth of a percent globally. Skin in the game and they're in. Yeah. Um, as I, you know, I, I see, I see, I see a process. I mean, they, you know, the central banks and the governments and this whole, you know, fiat debt uh, loaded system. Uh, I'm sure they can. Uh, they are able to blow up the bubble a little bit further. What do you call it? Procrastinate this whole system. Um, uh, but I think there are so many factors now in in play that could accelerate this process. And I, I don't see any other 
uh, avenue. I mean, there's no other option. I mean, do you see that? What's your perspective on your vision? Like, to, to, yeah, to... I mean, that's that's certainly what I believe. Like, it's uh, you know, a, a family man in a in a one wage house with two kids <laughs> in Southern California better have pretty strong conviction to uh, to jump into the founder's chair again and and essentially hinge your your financial future to uh, to Bitcoin. Um, I'm a full believer, and I think it's coming, and I think it's going to be, uh, as Murad says, uh, face melting. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, we are, I mean, of course, we are way too deep in the Bitcoin community and you know, following up on everything, listening, reading, talking to one another. So it seems also, I guess you can agree with me, it's the, the strength of the conviction and the trust and the comprehension level has really, really risen to a level that's never been seen before or felt before. I mean, that's my perception. Do you, do you have to? Yeah. Feel that? Yeah. So like, not only is that true. In, in the lifetime of Bitcoin, it's obviously like much stronger, but uh, it's also true versus basically anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, we often describe the sort of evangelism that we see in the Bitcoin space and just sort of the dedication and the, and the belief. It's like, uh, it's like 10 times more than, uh, than the worst CrossFitter 10 years ago when CrossFit exploded. And, you know, there are all these like paleo CrossFit people just kind of like annoying their friends at parties, just talking about eating chicken and applesauce or whatever, whatever their diet was. <laughs> and, you know, like, you just can't shut up a Bitcoin or like, it's to the point where, you know, like, I'd just much rather like be on Telegram talking to the Bitcoiners group or, you know, arguing with people in the nation or whatever. And, mm. uh, you know, instead of talking to the people in front of me, that's not healthy, but it's also true. <laughs> So Corey, do you see Bitcoin as um, as a precipice, um, you know, sort of a, a transition to a really totally new paradigm shift, uh, evolutionary, not on a monetary economic, but everything? I mean, do you, do you think we can tell people that, hey, I mean, we can have a totally new civilization where people finally, you know, we can disclose the technologies uh, which are going to serve humanity. People are going to work less, uh, be more passionate in their work because I know a lot of people in my environment, they just hate their jobs. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the future of mankind, the future of humanity in every so, aspect you can imagine. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of the best case scenario. Right. So these things, these potential outcomes are on a spectrum and, and something like that where everyone has, you know, lower time preference and the furniture is better made and the, the food is high quality and, you know, selling a piece of art for a lot of money generally will require actually spending a lot of time on that art, <laughs> whether, it, whether it's your craft or that particular piece. Um, so it'd be nice if all those things happen. And then, you know, worst case scenarios like, you know, basically you know, both from a time perspective, it takes way, way longer, probably because of the U.S. government direct interference. And then, you know, in the end, you know, it, it only becomes just like another asset. And so the thing about the thing about, you know, if Bitcoin is just an asset silo that fills up, that is something that, that people like, it's still you still get like 80 percent of the good stuff. So if if as you know Nick Batia uh, from Open Node and Tantra Labs, who's a you know, finance prof, have you had him on? No, not yet. Okay. Wonder, yeah, so you totally. I read his he's, articles. He's amazing. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's been doing the circle. Uh, he's been doing the circuit a bit. Time value of BTC on on Twitter and some medium posts. You know, so he's kind of saying something that's also along the lines of some of the things that Safe has been saying, which are also a lot of the things that Trace has been saying, and it basically boils down to you know it's. Like worst case scenario is that Bitcoin basically takes its place alongside gold and U.S. Treasuries as sort of the the three risk free assets, essentially. Not the dollar, the Treasuries, um, because that's actually like you 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 can trust that more, and it actually does have positive yield, whereas the dollar does not. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so so that would still provide a huge check on uh, you know tyranny and wanton money printing and, and things like that around the globe. So if, if uh, you know, privacy tech on Bitcoin continues to improve and, and knowledge of how to use it continues to improve and it just gets easier and easier with, you know, um, you know different services and, and ways to acquire Bitcoin and move some of your wealth into Bitcoin, 
essentially, as uh, Andreas used to say, to be able to exit uh, financially, but not physically, um, so that you can essentially exit the financial system in Argentina or Iran or Turkey or whatever without having to actually move your family. Um, that will provide a check against tyranny uh, like we've never had before. And that would still be, you know, you'd still get 80% of the benefit, you know, without the utopia. <laughs> right, right. And so if I was handicapping and saying like, which one is more likely, I'd probably say the 80% outcome is probably more likely, but I'm certainly going to strive for the whole enchilada. Like, mixed metaphors. Like, yes, I do want all of us to live better, but it also may be enough that people that really want to, like people are already living better when they get into Bitcoin. They're already getting healthier and eating better and understanding, exactly. you know, what's It changes you, right? Things. Bitcoin it changes, changes it. it, yeah. Yeah, it's like seven generation thinking as our, you know, 6.15 yeah. buddy, uh, American Hoddle would say, like you're thinking about your legacy and, and the next generations and, you know, you don't ever want to sell, but you just want to pass it down to the next generations. And only when somebody like really needs a house do you part with some of your gold or your sheep back in the day, mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, the way, the way I hope this whole thing works out, um, you know, well, this is, you know, it, from your, your native region, like I often talk about the Phoenician empire as kind of like the ideal and obviously heavily influenced by Taleb here and, and by spending a lot of time in that region. My wife is uh, originally from Istanbul. Uh, so we go out there every year and, and, and hang out and kind of like steeped in the culture there. Um, but, you know, the Phoenician empire, which, you know, was a lot of what became the Eastern Roman empire, um, but it was mostly Anatolia and it was all the traditional trading cities in the Eastern Levant, which is now, you know, Lebanon, Israel, Syria, uh, and then all through like sort of Northern Egypt. Um, that culture, you know, basically was like a couple thousand years of, of, you know, an incredibly strong trading and mercantile and commercial empire that doesn't get written about or talked about much because they didn't have a bunch of wars. But it was the free trading and the commerce that made people of different religions and sects and beliefs, you know, transact with each other because they just wanted to take care of their families and like build a nicer house or have a nicer church or mosque or whatever. The mosques as much back then, but um, you know, the I, I think that would be nice. So I, I very much think that the world drastically improves, and I don't think this is far off when Bitcoin is an accepted unit of account. I think we could actually be like maybe 15 years away from everyone globally yeah. being able to price in their local currency and also in Bitcoin. There's precedent for that. You know, there was a good 50 year run there where everybody mm -hmm. could price in gold uh, because of, you know, 1870 up until the Fed, basically, you could price in gold in your local currency and, and or use, you know, gold backed banknotes from the Bank of England and, and transact in those or at least price in those. So I do think that everybody will be able to price in sats and Bitcoin in like 15 years globally. And that alone will just, you know, reduce massive friction and, and just increase cooperation and, and give us a much bigger playing field. And, you know, economies are, are very similar. They, they kind of follow Moore's law. And so you do have this kind of like exponential improvement in productivity and friction-free commerce that brings peace if you can have just a single currency, even if it's not actually being used in the transaction, just the fact that people will be able to price in it will let you and I, you know, buy goods and services from Vietnam or Brazil, pretty friction free. Beautifully said. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, when people, when a society, a civilization, uh, you know, is able to flourish with trade, with commerce, you know, with new technologies, you know, as also in Safed and Amu's book, Original uh, Zero to One, you mentioned that Peter Thiel's, you know, Zero to One, One to Many. Uh, technological. This is what, what, to be honest, you know, again, I always say that it's the most thrilling aspect and uh, a vision uh, connected to Bitcoin is that, wow, what kind of civilization could we have on, you know, on a monetary root laying of Bitcoin? This is, this could be like, uh, I mean, we couldn't even probably imagine. So I'm trying to be, you know, I'm on the one hand, I'm optimistic. I'm trying, on the other hand, I'm trying to be realistic, optimistic and realistic. So um so yeah so you already know what my approach is my approach is yeah. spend spend all my time protecting the downside just making sure that it has the opportunity to, to happen like and then you know the the call option function like it's going to be better i don't know how much better what i want to make sure is that it has that opportunity to go up the s curve to get adopted globally whatever it is so i'm just like my what i can do is i can help protect the downside so I do a lot of coordinating with, you know, helping 
mining executives find each other and talk to each other and you know diversify mining methods and geographies i do a lot like basically helping bitcoin thought leaders sort of rally to the defense and and find out when you know someone influential and deceitful is talking about bitcoin in a, in a deceitful way and so that we can like make sure that somebody takes up the call and and is ready to parry that whether on twitter or on tv or whatever and then you know with this product you know, I think that uh, I'm trying to create the, uh, you know, the the critical adoption level that inoculates Bitcoin against uh, negative actions in a very concerted way by the U.S. government. Yeah, exactly. And you know, I see I see the a vertical trajectory. To be honest with you, this is is uh, it's just uh, it's not you know uh, if but just yeah as you, you know just a matter just of when. When, yeah, yeah, if, if it's going to be can real, stop like it a... from getting messed with, it'll right. go. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, because like, what's the downside is like, you know, seven thousand, and the upside is like a million <laughs> per coin. Oh, crazy, yeah, you yeah. know, or more. Right. Um, so yes, you would want to, you would want to be on, you want to be long on Bitcoin, and you want to be hodling. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of trader friends, and that's totally fine. Like, trade in and out of it all you want but make sure you have a fat stack that you never touch as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you also know like, a, uh, there's a, like there's a group of people within the, you know, uh, conventional conservative world of finance investment that, that are like out of principle, they, they're not, they're just not interested. I mean, they're just, you know, they don't want to understand. They don't go into, you know, I've been listening a little, little bit to the, all these interviews. Um, you know, with, with macro and uh, investors, is there, is there a shift going on or is it, is it just a stubbornness? Like it's, it's person by person, you know, okay. and, and one, so it's two things. So one, most of the times when Bitcoin has been able to recruit uh, someone, you know, sort of from high finance or from the macro world into Bitcoin, they come in and they're really excited about it. And then they look for a way to make money in it. And they can't unless they're a trader. So mm -hmm. unless they're unless they're an act like the only ways really to to make money in Bitcoin is uh, trading, uh, providing mining equipment has been profitable. Broadly, miners have not been profitable over time. Like on average, um, that doesn't mean individual mining companies. Obviously, some have succeeded greatly, but providing mining equipment and essentially like you know S9s and S17s, Bitmain's business has been a profitable industry trading has been a profitable industry and you know kind of what's let what's yet to be seen but obviously where i'm placing a bet is um i actually believe that infrastructure uh will be a very profitable um way to participate in this and so you could see the exchanges is kind of like you know people point to exchanges i see in exchanges as like one part of infrastructure so already if you just count exchanges and this is for bitcoin and also for you know, all, all the other coins um, have been profitable as an industry, wildly profitable. Um, but I do think other things like financial services along the lines of what Unchained Capital is doing or like what we're doing with, you know, combining an on-ramp with, with education, I think this is, has a ton of upside. Um, and I think you'll see more and more in the infrastructure space. And I, I would count all of the lightning companies and everything that's going on with the, the refill, and the gold, and, you know, the node companies like Casa and Nautil, like I think these are all uh, great businesses that will flourish and, you know, potentially outperform Bitcoin um, just because they're actually more of a, um, they're levered on adoption uh, and spread of Bitcoin, the idea, not just Bitcoin price. So you can keep growing as a company like this, uh, even in a downturn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes total sense. Um... What I, I wanted to wrap this up. Um, let me ask you: Do you think people are um, still? I mean, when when I observe people around me, or you know, the 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 the, the statements that are being said, um, a lot. It's like it's like really mind boggling. You know? um, because I heard even an old man say, "Yeah, Bitcoin. Oh, that's that's just a fraud." And I'm like, "Okay, so you know, well, you know, I didn't I didn't actually answer your question." Yeah, go ahead. Um, so and I got I got diverted and excited, but um, basically what generally happens with these macro guys that come in or the fund managers or whatever is they come in and they realize they can't actually make money working in Bitcoin mm -hmm. and they start a crypto fund 
because they need to they need to have like something else going on in the bucket to justify you know the two percent plus the carry mm -hmm. right so like over and over and over again over and over and over and over again that's what happens um and it's 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 probably okay like they're you know obviously conflicted and don't feel super great about themselves if they're hardcore bitcoin believers and they have to talk about this other stuff too um, but there are certain, you know, swing trades and long-term holds, you know, where if you pick the right one, you know, maybe it goes up more than Bitcoin in the next bull cycle or whatever. Or, you know, if you have a venture pocket or, or, or if you're a venture fund, like, sure, there are good companies that, you know, sprinkle some blockchain on it and, you know, claim that they're doing something with the underlying technology, which, you know, Bitcoiners don't really believe. But, you know, at the end of the day, like distributed databases with, with you know, permissions can be valuable, especially if you can start a consortium, you know, it has nothing to do with Bitcoin or cryptocurrency or tokens or tokens aren't necessary at all. But if it's a way of thinking about distributed systems and, and a company can raise on that and can build a successful business, then like, you know, who are we to say that, you know, a fund manager with that broad mandate, you know, shouldn't use their access and skills to get a good price on that deal? Like, sure. I mean, you're going to, bet against the guys from avant credit starting spring labs like they're probably going to do great you know bet against like john linden starting mythical games like his team has built some of the best games ever and the, you know whatever they're doing with eth or eos or whatever will probably be bitcoin eventually if they're you know linking yeah. it to a chain somehow but who cares if they want to make their characters unique and have some nfts or whatever like you know it's probably still a good venture investment <laughs> you know it's just not it's just a whole other thing like the the upside of all of all of those you know non-bitcoin projects is probably like a trillion total whereas like the upside for bitcoin itself is probably like one to two hundred trillion so you know if you're thinking about like what's interesting to build infrastructure for and what's interesting to spend your time on like for me it's like i just can't really get i can't, I can't get excited about anything else um just because of what i understand you know they say believe i say understand to be the upside of of this one asset class bitcoin versus the upside of all the others but um you know for a venture capitalist or a venture fund or whatever to be investing in particular companies and teams you know that have sprinkled the blockchain on it like can't really fault them and they're probably still going to end up red pilling a bunch of people into bitcoin we're so much in the beginning. I mean, it's, but on the other hand, you know, I'm like, uh, as you say, it's, it's the, the speed of development and technological advancement and the development, the background, would it be whatever, lightning, the wallets, the, the, the easy accessibility, the, you know, the full node. Now we can already get a plug and play Casa. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, isn't it? I mean, it's, uh, yeah. You know, the future is here. It's just not widely understood. It's not widely spread, right? Like, the tools are basically here, you know, like Wasabi works and <laughs> you know, Samurai is dope and Cold Card is awesome. And then he just like built BitBoy over a couple weekends. Like it's, it's just insane what people are doing, but it's just not like packaged and distributed out for, for mass consumption. And, you know, I think it's been very clear that, you know, maybe the biggest Bitcoin bull market over the last two years uh, has been in education, just the quality of the, the books the quality of people that have come out of the woodwork and understood Bitcoin and, and are skilled communicators uh, and are getting bigger audiences. You know, I just, I look at somebody like Connor Brown that wasn't in Bitcoin 16 yeah. months ago. He joined 15 months ago and, you know, brought up his understanding to an insanely high level, like very quickly and, you know, can do the rounds and, and help people understand Bitcoin or, you know, probably three years ago, Jan was still at Reverb and he quit and wrote a book. And, Jan Britzka, and, yeah, and yeah, it's yeah, awesome. Yeah. And Jan Britzka, well. and, uh -huh. you know, like, and we think like it feels like Stefan Levera has been around forever. His podcast, yeah. like, eighteen months old or something. Like, it's insane. <laughs> like, the Bitcoin standard came out in summer of eighteen. Like, crazy. We're kind of sometimes we're impatient. Yeah, like, I am. Just, I know. I know my weakness. Yeah. I am impatient. I'm, you know, because I see, I, I see too. the potential. Like, I know, yeah. I know, like, I know the potential for this utility. This like easy giving and requesting of Bitcoin through like mm -hmm. a super simple interface where we do educating and you don't, you don't have to be like Bitcoin IT support for life. Like we'll do that. Like I know this has insane potential and that it's going to be used by tens of millions of people, but like you just kind of have to, you have to have patience and you have to put in the work and you have to let Bitcoin do its thing and, and it'll go. 
Let me ask you for you know conclusion. Uh, you know that those uh, Tesla Elon Musk advertisements, they they you know they're like three minutes, and you see you know beautiful, uh, you know smooth pictures. It's it it conveys the emotions like the vision of the future. Do you think we could we we could uh, there is more potential in uh, you know picking up the people as I say emotionally on an emotional level? Like what is the true potential of Bitcoin? Yeah, so, I mean, it would be awesome if somebody wants to hire, like, Lee Clow uh, to do, like, the next version of, you know, the, the 1984 Apple ad yeah. or, think, or Think Different or something like that. And if somebody wants to buy, you know, $8 million of ad space for a 60-second ad on the Super Bowl, like, yeah, sure. Uh, I, I can see something like that happening, like, in the next bull run where somebody just kind of, you know, one person or five people get together and spend a couple mil each and, you know, commission an amazing Super Bowl mm -hmm. ad. That would be pretty splashy. Um, in the meantime, like, you know, I mean, there, there, there are really fun and cool and smart emotional appeals to Bitcoin. Um, they're just to date, as you know, like just not very well funded, you know? So like, you know, the Bitcoin rabbi just put out like an animated version of his yeah. book. And, you know, but like, it would be sick if that looked like, a, you know, like Toy Story. <laughs> you know, wow. like, it's wow. pretty good and it gets the point across, but like, it'd be awesome if it had, you know, a huge budget behind the animation. Um, and, you know, like, I just think of that for, for pretty much anything. Like, it'd be great if, if we or Fold, you know, had $10 million of venture funding just for marketing over the next 12 months. Right. Which is basically what, like, the, the fourth entrant into an established space in Silicon Valley that wants to catch up to the first three, you get like a you know, $10 million seed round and a $20 million A round and half of the A round is earmarked for marketing. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it would, be nice. it would be nice to have that. I think the next bull run will kind of open that up. When you start to see some more infrastructure plays besides the only one that's generally returned for venture being exchanges, I think it was Coinbase and Graphic that returned for US venture um unless they had a slice of some asian exchanges uh i think when you start to see some good returns from some of the bitcoin infrastructure companies getting marked up mm -hmm. with you know either exits or larger larger raises at much higher, higher valuations which i i do see basically as soon as the next bitcoin bull run comes um then i think you'll basically start to see a lot of bets being placed again yeah i mean we're still in the you know a uh, very very bearish market uh, what's the price for, uh, as of uh, november 25th it's like what uh, i just just know the, the euro price is around 6500 euro so i see in the future you, you know could, you could you could literally gather mm -hmm. the, the the current bitcoin ceos who have uh deep connections in silicon valley uh could fit here behind my desk <laughs> oh my god Seriously. I don't even mean like in my office or in the building. Like, I mean, I could probably put like, you know, eight or nine people here and that would be it. Incredible. You know, so there are awesome Bitcoin entrepreneurs building sick companies and great tech, but like yeah. they, ha they haven't spent the time, you know, for whatever reason, you know, over the years building up a network in Silicon Valley and those guys in SB, like generally invest in people that they know where they have long track records and like deep network ties and that's generally just how it goes. Um, so we have a long way to go and we need to make some inroads and, you know, venture capital is not this sort of like, you know, obelisk where you bang at it and it's hard and you're just like, you know, the 2001 monkeys trying to get into venture capital. Like it's actually just like how new businesses generally get funded. Yeah. Like there's more diversity in venture capitalists than there is among Bitcoiners for sure, it seems mm -hmm. like. Um, so you can find we'll we'll chip away at it and we'll find we'll find the people that are VCs and Bitcoiners. And there are a lot already, but we haven't shown them this, you know, so far how to how to deliver venture quality returns, you know, as a space. Um, and that's why it's been it's been hard to get that funding that will then give the big marketing budget that will then make the you know the splashy marketing campaign and you know although i think you know, i think the uh, drop gold was pretty splashy so that, yeah yeah you know. got a lot of uh, heavy critics and whatever but yeah. but the message got but it was noisy it was noisy yeah, it was exactly. interesting 
Um, yeah. You know, it's it's not like the it's not like companies haven't spent. So that was that was Silver and DCG for mm -hmm. for the Bitcoin Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. Uh, you know, the the, the Winklevoss twins and Gemini did mm -hmm. uh, a lot of outdoor ads around crypto needs rules, um, which met with somewhat tepid <laughs> feedback from Bitcoiners for sure. Um, you know, but it started a conversation, and they certainly put budget behind it. So I think it's more, you know, it's not like it's not like Coinbase doesn't advertise. They they have like crazy crazy ad budgets across Google and Facebook. Um, so I think it's more just, you know, how do you how do you craft messages that uh, and then get budget behind it for companies or projects that are like more purely aligned with Bitcoin, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Corey, I mean, I, uh, as I said, I love your project. I fully, totally, I totally support it. And I'm, because I love the ethos, you know, the, the simplicity and the vision behind it. Um, as uh, you know, before I forget, I, that's what, what I see, you know, once uh, we get out of this uh, so-called bear mug or whatever, and, the, and people are accumulating or gifting or are being gifted Bitcoin through give Bitcoin, uh, you know, in a couple of whatever, it could even be in a couple of weeks, months, or a couple of years, once it rises, you know, beyond expectation, I see a series of testimonials of people having been gifted of Bitcoin, you know, a series like a film, a movie, yeah. or whatever documentary, a series of art, uh, you know, from young to old, saying, oh my God, you know, like whatever, my yeah. grandma gifted me, whatever, <laughs> this and this, uh, Bitcoin, and, and now it's worth this much you know it's changed my life you know it's like it changed yeah. it changes lives and this is i think this this is where the emotion comes through yeah i mean it's it's two gifts in one right we like to say uh you know it it's the gift of bitcoin with a capital b not just mm -hmm. bitcoin with a, low, with a lowercase b mm -hmm. because you're giving you know potentially a way to you know bring them into a way of thinking and looking at the world and questioning what money is and and you know it it, it forces you down down the path to understanding history and economics and society and politics and all of these other things, right. That we just sort of like take for granted in, in this matrix that we live in. Um, you know, so I think, I think that's as powerful. Um, we have a, a little line that we say like, um, throughout history, uh, the gift that people most want to receive is either something thoughtful, you know, that you put some effort into or just give me the money. And, you know, Bitcoin is the first time that you can actually give the thoughtful gift of money. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful said. Um, Corey, any other uh, final thoughts or you want to share something with my listeners and viewers? I really enjoyed our talk and I'm sure my listeners too. So is there anything like you, you people really should know it or, or dig deeper or go into the rabbit hole? Um, I mean, honestly, I'll just like, I'll, I'll just tease it. Like if you want to just DM us on Twitter or email me at 21 million at givebitcoin.io and ask for a ref code, uh, we're getting that started this week. And so, uh, we won't have like the, the sat stacking, uh, it'll all just be on the back end. We haven't built it into the, into the front end yet, but we are already tallying, uh, who's referring who and stacking the sats in the background. Uh, so I would just encourage people to, to get their URL and use this holiday season to start going nuts and, and onboarding people onto, uh, getting them to sign up for Give Bitcoin. Yeah, I put those, I'm going to put those, all those links, uh, in the show notes. Beautiful. So on Twitter it's, uh, yeah. Uh, give underscore Bitcoin. Yep. Uh, do you want to like give your own, uh, do you, um, Twitter handle or yeah, you can put it on there. It's, it's Corey Clipston, C-O-R-Y. That's actually me there. Uh, Bitcoin mm -hmm. Morpheus. Uh, handing handing Neo the red pill, uh, Corey Clipston. <laughs> Super. Yeah. All right. So give Bitcoin.io. Well. Yeah. Corey, thank you so much. Uh, I hope we can repeat this. Maybe even uh, maybe in life. I thought yeah. if you're if you ever come to Europe or to Austria, let me know. I would love to sit down with you in person and do a you know face to face interview. Maybe I can get you to take a little side trip down to uh, Istanbul uh, when we're over there next summer. Yeah, would be awesome. Yeah, we can, do it from, uh, we can yeah. go live from uh, from Galata Tower or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's do that. From the, from the Grand Bazaar, we'll, uh, we'll 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 go and uh, ask some uh, some merchants that have passed their shops down for a thousand years about Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> History, yeah, repeating. Yeah. 
Wonderful. Well, Corey, All thank right. you so much. I really enjoyed that. And uh, we'll uh, talk to you soon, hopefully. All right? Sounds good, Kevin. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Welcome to the Total Connector. My name is Kevin Davani. Total Bitcoin, total freedom. The hardest and scarcest money ever created in human history. Bitcoin.